Hello everyone, Golden Nova here. With the release of Rage of the Abyss, another chapter of the Diabell Star lore has been unlocked. After a most eventful flashback to the origin of the spellcaster's time in the White Forest, we found ourselves in jail! Damn, Diabellstar and Diabells must have gone on one heck of a bender after that fight. Even the goblin bikers joined in on the fun. But what exactly is going on here? What are the charges? And why exactly are these Cronenbergian evolutions of our old mentors coming to break us out slash break us in half? Well, if you're looking for answers, then congratulations, you've come to the right place. Get ready to delve deeper into this frightening fairy tale with Azamina Explained. Today's episode is brought to you by my lovely patrons, as well as the wonderful people over at Dragon Shield. Get the sleeves as strong as dragon scales and save 5% on your order by using coupon code GOLDENNOVA at checkout. But before we get to the new antagonists, we need to catch up with some previous archetypes that got some updates this pack. So we're going to lump them all together right here. We'll be covering Goblin Bikers, Sinful Spoils, and White Forest, the official name of the theme I previously had down as White Woods. And speaking of names that aren't exactly going to survive the localization process, Badass Goblin Bikers, a level 6 Dark Fiend monster with 2400 attack and 0 defense. And if you control no monsters, or all monsters you control are goblin monsters, you can normal summon this card without tributing. And if this card is normal or special summoned, you can special summon a level 4 or lower goblin monster from your deck. And if this card is sent to the grave, you can target a card on the field and attach it to your goblin Xyz monster as material. Wait, uh, that's kind of stacked. It hits board, you get a free goblin. It hits the grave, you absorb a monster as material as long as you have a goblin Xyz monster. Kind of like a New Age Silent Honor arc. It's kind of goofy. The only problem is actually getting this onto the board. Unlike its contemporaries, Badass is a level 6 monster, so you need to fulfill the no tributing requirement to get this onto the field like any other monster. But we do have some other options. Mean Merciless can drop this out of your hand with its effect, and with Grand Bash, the extra normal summon means you aren't always going to waste your only normal summon on this. And speaking of Bash, not only does Badass give you a 6 so our other goblins can copy onto it to make Crazy Beast, you can combine their levels together to make rank 9s, and while Calamities is no longer an option, thank god, Enter Blatnir is still a really flexible utility monster, Hyperiton gives you some funny negation options, and a generator Lavatin is some great removal. And, big bonus for us, we get to spend the next few months speculating what the replacement name is gonna be. Let me know your guess down below. Personally, I'm going for the good, the bad, and the goblin bikers. Goblin Biker Grand Imprisonment is a quick play spell card that tributes a monster to special summon a goblin monster from your deck, but it can't attack this turn. When a monster declares an attack, you can banish this card from your grave and detach any number of material from your goblin Xyz monsters to have all face-up monsters your opponent currently controls lose a thousand attack for each material detached until the end of this turn. Hey look, another way to get badass onto the field. It's not as easy as activating it, you do need that tribute, but because it can eat any monster for it, this works well with any free material you just slap onto the board. And while that monster can't attack, we're an Xyz deck, we'll just be using it as material anyway. The grave effect is also pretty solid, even just attaching one can be huge. A monster going down by a whole thousand points can really take the fuel out of their engine while you run over them. Though nothing stops you from detaching three material to completely gut their attack power if you have the spares. So we're looking at a card that helps us get the right goblin biker into rotation, or really any goblin that we want, and is the triumphant debut of our latest biker, Dromojamon. Glad to see we finally got that Digimon crossover. The Fiend of the White Forest is a quick play spell card that has you tributing a synchro monster to target a face-up card on the field and negate its effects until the end of the turn. Then, if you tributed a White Forest Synchro monster at activation, you can special summon an Illusion monster from your graveyard. And like many of the White Forest Spell and Trap cards, if sent to the grave to activate a monster effect, you can set this card. That makes it a fantastic card to feed to your White Forest monsters when going first, because you aren't likely to get any targets for this effect at that time. So you can use it to enable an on-theme monster, then it'll come back to help you on a later turn. The Synchro monsters are easy to recycle thanks to Rusia and Sylvie, and because you can 
survive an illusion if you tribute it on Theme Monster, you can basically tribute Diabelle and bring it right back. Heck, we even get another instance of the art telling us how to use the card optimally, as well as adding a bit more depth to the lore that I cannot wait to get into. But point of order, Diabelle is not the fiend of the White Forest, they're an illusion monster! Are you telling me that these fairy tales aren't 100% accurate? Sinful Spoils Offenders is a normal trap card that you can activate if your opponent special summons any number of monsters from the deck or extra deck and you control a Diabelle Star monster card. It has you targeting a monster they control and shuffling it into the deck. Also, during the damage step, if your Diabelle Star monster battles an opponent's monster, you can banish this card from your grave and that opponent's monster's attack becomes halved until the end of the turn. This reminds me a lot of Toon Briefcase, a kind of on-summon retaliation, though this is better because it can hit any monster your opponent controls, not just the summoned monster that triggered it, so it's much more flexible in that regard. And note that it checks to see if you control a Diabelle Star monster card. This means it'll work not only when the Black Witch is in your monster zone, but also if you have Snake Eye Diabelle Star in the back row. And then we have a grave effect that debuffs a monster fighting our Diabelle Star, but that's just icing on the cake. As far as Sinful Spoils cards go, it's nice, but nowhere near the level of playability that our other targets have. If people were hesitant to run Sinful Spoils of Betrayal, this one isn't going to be much more convincing. I mean, just look at it. Diabelle Star is even holding the Ursiella Scythe like it's some kind of red flag. Goblin Biker Grand Crisis is a continuous trap card that has you targeting a goblin monster you control and a monster your opponent controls, or a goblin monster in your grave and a monster in your opponent's grave and banish both of them. You can send this face-up card from your spell and trap zone to the grave, then target five of your banished goblin monsters with different names and special summon them. You can only use one effect of this card per turn, and only once per turn. This gives us some pretty sweet removal, but I'm not totally sold. True, because it banishes both, not both targets, you can do something with the goblin that you targeted before the effect resolves and still get that removal, but the fact that you can only target a goblin in the same zone as the card you want to get rid of is pretty frustrating. It would have been a lot better if you could say, target a goblin on your field or grave to target a monster on your opponent's field or in their grave instead, but it's still pretty nifty. And once again, it comes with a secondary effect that isn't really the main reason you should play it, but it's nice to have it. Goblin bikers, and once again, goblins in general, don't really have a lot of banishing in their back pocket, so you're relying on Grand Crisis or some off-theme cards to fuel that, which can be devastating if it resolves, true, but is basically a pipe dream. It'll take a lot more to jailbreak this theme. Alright, that covers all the updates from previous themes, now it's time to lock in on the new lore archetype, the Azamina. What's the deal with them? Well, there are a series of Dark Illusion Fusion monsters, that's right, no main deck monsters, that feed upon the Sinful Spoils cards, even more so than the previous themes. And speaking of previous themes, a few of them are corrupted versions of our White Forest mentors, mirroring their stats and capabilities to devastating effect. First up is Azamina Mew Ursialigo, a level 6 monster with 2000 attack and 2400 defense, requiring an illusion monster and a light spellcaster monster as material. While on the field, monsters your opponent controls lose 500 attack and defense for each Azamina monster you control. And if this card is fusion summoned, you can add an Azamina or Sinful Spoils card from your deck to your hand. Also, if this card is destroyed by a battle or card effect, you can add a Sinful Spoils spell card from your deck to your hand. This is a pretty fantastic start. Hitting the board with a self-sufficient 500 point debuff is pretty nice, and it only grows as you develop your board. It immediately gets you back a card, and gets you another when it's destroyed. So no matter what Mew is doing, it's always getting you advantage. It may not be a vampire, but it's enough power to drive you batty. Azamina Rhea Silvera is a level 6 monster with 1900 attack and 1500 defense, requiring an illusion monster and a light spellcaster monster as material. While on the field, all battle damage from your Azamina monsters inflicted to your opponent is doubled, except when it comes from copies of this card. When your opponent activates a card or effect as a quick effect, you can tribute this card to negate the effect, and if this card is destroyed by battle or card effect, you can add a Sinful Spoils trap card from your deck to your hand. Ah, more damage doubling, you love to see it. You do need help from your teammates to actually make use of it, but with Mew's stat reduction, you're in pretty good company. Not to mention that while it doesn't destroy, Rhea is an Omni Negate, so it's in a great position to help keep your board protected. 
Granted, doing so is at odds with its own floating effect, but let's be real, our trap cards are okay at best, so it's not a terrible trade-off. Also, we can all agree that this is the best Cerberus best, best Cerberus in the whole game, huh? <laughs> Azamina Soul Erisichathon is a level 6 monster with 2700 attack and 0 defense, requiring an illusion monster and a fiend monster as material. Hmm. If this card is fusion summoned, you can target a card on the field and send it to the graveyard, and during each standby phase, you can target an Azamina or Sinful Spoils card in your grave and add it to your hand. Yup, that's each standby phase, so you'll be positioned to recycle a ton of cards very quickly. And let's just say that's going to be very important for our later support. But that's not all there is to like here. As a fusion that requires a fiend monster, this can be made with Chimera Fusion, and actually fits right into the theme. The recovery might not be as useful in those piles, but if Azamina ever gets integrated into those Chimera decks, this will be a stupendous addition. Though I'd be careful about adding Erisichathon on such a flimsy basis, you wouldn't want that to be the sole reason you bring it on board. Azamina Moa Regina is a level 8 monster with 3000 attack and 2000 defense, requiring an illusion monster and a level 6 or higher fiend monster as material. It can target an illusion monster in your grave except a copy of this card and a special summon it. And when a sinful spoils or Azamina card or effect is activated as a quick effect, you can target up to 2 cards on the field and destroy them. Here it is, our big boss monster, and it's kind of a doozy. Because it can revive an illusion every turn, we can keep getting back our our Azamina's as long as they've been properly summoned, benefiting from their effects every turn. And when we use an on-theme effect or a Sinful Spoils one, we also get to pop two cards. It's very simple, but very effective. It's just a shame the game lacks a good level 6 or higher Fiend monster that can be used as the second half of this card's fusion material requirements. Nope, can't think of any outrageously powerful level 6 or higher Fiend monsters, especially in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! That would be a... That would be patently absurd! Alright, that covers all of our fusions, and now it's time for those spells and traps. Sacred Azamina is a normal spell card that has you revealing an Azamina fusion monster from your extra deck and sending a Sinful Spoils card from your hand and or field to the grave for every four levels the revealed monster has and special summoning it. This fusion is treated as a fusion summon, so you get all the benefits of your on fusion summon effects, and is treated as being properly summoned. Though if you want to send any set sinful spoil cards, you will have to reveal them first. And while this card is in the grave, you can target an Azamina monster you control or that's in your grave to shuffle the target into the deck, and if you do, add this card into your hand. This is very reminiscent of the White Forest Mentor's ability to recycle your synchros to bring them back to the field. Gonna have to revisit that implication later. But yeah, if you're playing any of the other Diabell Star lore archetypes, Sacred Azamina will let you access the fusions at the cost of consuming your sinful spoils. Because at the risk of tipping my hand a bit too soon, this isn't the last time we'll be seeing that effect, and it's very recyclable. Especially because two of our Azamanas float into more Sinful Spoils when they're destroyed, giving you more fuel for the fire, while Soul gets you a Sinful Spoil or Azamana card back from your grave every turn. So while this seems costly on the surface, a lot of it actually pays for itself. Though I think this card is showing up a bit late. There's a whole Yu-Gi-Oh game called The Sacred Cards. You'd think this would have been included. Azamina Ophelitus is a quick play spell card that can be activated during the main phase to summon out an Azamina fusion monster from your extra deck, basically like how Sacred does it. Also, during your main phase, you can banish this card from your grave, then target an Azamina monster in your grave and special summon it. We can only use one effect of this card per turn, and only once per turn. So now you can deploy your Azamanas at quick speed, which is super useful thanks to Soul's removal, and lets you bring your Azamanas back on future turns, giving you outstanding longevity. This works really well with Moa because it can then revive more Azamanas, and the advantage just spirals out from there. A lot of your plays are going to be derived from this card specifically, so you really do owe it a debt of gratitude. Sinful Spoils Deception is a continuous spell card that lets you tribute a monster from your hand or field to add an Azamina card from your deck to your hand. If any number of monsters are sent to your opponent's grave and you control an Azamina monster except during the damage step, you can make your opponent lose 1500 life points, and if you do, you gain 1500 life points. And during the end phase, if this card is in your grave because it was sent there from the spell and trap zone this turn while face up, you can set it. 
Oh yeah, this card is a huge win, not just for Azamina, but for White Forest as well. If you have any of the spellcasters, send this while face up on the field to the graveyard for their effects. You can set it back to your field, giving you a way to use it as fuel over and over again. And the same applies for Azamina, but even better. You tribute a monster with this to get Azamina Sacred or Ophelitus, then send Deception to summon out any of our level 6s. Then, during the end phase, you get Deception back. So as long as your opponent doesn't throw any removal at Deception, you'll have a free card to fuel these effects over and over again. Again. And it's even a very lore appropriate loop as well, as it mimics the eternal torment that the mentors now have to live through. Yay! Azamina Hamarsha is a normal trap card that can also summon out Azamina fusion monsters, kind of like how Sacred and Ophelitus does. However, instead of sending Sinful Spoils cards to the grave, you instead shuffle Sinful Spoils from your grave and or banishment into your deck for every four levels the fusion monster has, and it's also treated as a fusion summon. And while this card is in the grave, you can banish this card to target a Sinful Spoils spell or trap card in your grave and set it, but it cannot be activated this turn and you can only use one effect of this card per turn, and only once per turn. So you trade out the speed of the previous Azamina summoning cards, and in exchange, you basically get to summon them for free while recycling your Sinful Spoils cards. Very neat. Like with Ophelitis, this can bring out Soul at quick speed, though this time you aren't restricted to only using it during the main phase, so you can do some battle phase shenanigans with it. And on top of everything else, it also gets you Sinful Spoils back into semi-immediate rotation, putting them back on the field and giving them a second shot at usability. It's a fantastic search off of Muse on Summon Effect, and I look forward to it being used in just about every Sinful Spoils deck out there as a way to get bodies onto the board, remove our opponent's stuff, and get more usage out of our Wanteds. But as a trap card, it can be a bit unwieldy to use, so it's not without its own fatal flaws. Alright, so that's all of the Azamina cards, but what do we do with them? Well, without a robust main deck core, this is another series of cards that work best in other themes instead of as a dedicated strategy, at least for now. As a suite of extra deck monsters, they don't brick your main deck, but do give you access to a number of vital effects that can help you push through a number of board states, as long as you have the sinful spoils to spend on them. So what can we play to help them out? We've already talked about how the fusions work well with the Chimera Pile, which might make you think they also work well with Branded, which is currently Chimera's closest friends. But you'll need to keep the following in mind. Blazing Cartesia does not work very well with Rhea and Mew, because that effect only fusion summons level 8 and higher monsters. So even though they're a light spellcaster, it's not going to make for the best material using its own effect. However, both Lubellian and Branded Albion can fusion summon level 8 and lower monsters, so those can use Cartesia or any other Dogmatica related monster if you don't need those effects to access some of your other wild fusions. Just about every Sinful Spoil card works well with the Zominas because you need them to fuel the summoning effects, but what are the best ones we can use? Well, Subduel gets some illusion monsters into rotation to use as fusion material. Susurus is another way we can get our Azamanas back into rotation while saving another monster. And Morion is cool because you can send it to summon an Azamana, then reset it from the graveyard because you control an illusion monster. Oh, and while we're on the subject, a little trick you can do with your Sinful Spoils to make the most of your Azamanas. You know how you can activate board breakers like Raigeki or Harpy's Feather Duster, and then later on that same chain activate Forbidden Droplets, sending that spell card to the graveyard to get a little extra negation out of it? Well, you can do the same thing with Ophelettus. Because it's a quick play spell, you can activate any of your Sinful Spoils cards, and then chain our quick play Azamana spell, sending that Sinful Spoils card to the graveyard. At that point, it's not like you even spent any cards to activate it at all. At least when it comes to summoning our level 6s. For the level 8s, we are going to have to spend at least one more. We're also going to need a healthy supply of illusion monsters to use as fusion material. Diabelles is basically a given because we'll be sending sinful spoils to the grave left, right, and center. Master Tao the Chanter can revive your Azamanas or any other illusions that make their way into the graveyard when it hits board. And Big Winged Burfamit can do something similar if sent to the grave as fusion material, which is useful not just for the Chimera line of fusions, but also as material for Soul. The new Gazelle can also add any illusion monster from deck to hand if used as fusion material, but Beast doesn't have quite the same crossover with Azamina as Burfamet does. 
It's also hard to ignore the usefulness of Nightmare Apprentice getting you any illusion on summon for just a discard, which can include the illustrious Nightmare Magician. Stealing monsters and removal is a pretty sweet loadout of effects to have on a single monster, and should be included in any deck that can support it. As for the fiends we'll need if we want to actually fusion summon these monsters, I know I was being a bit facetious earlier, but to spell it out, Fiendsmith is a strong option. Ubel also provides a lot of high-level fiends, and the protection provided by Phantom of Ubel is most certainly welcome. Unchained has a few options, but its tendency to lock you into only summoning fiends doesn't really mesh well with all of the illusions we want to put on board. A pretty good consideration might be the Labyrinth monsters. Many are level 6 or over, and now you can back up your monster lineup with a terrifying spread of normal trap cards. Heck, Hamartia itself is a normal trap, so you can set it off of Lady Labyrinth. Radian, the multidimensional kaiju, is also a nifty inclusion, as it can act both as a way to polymorph an opponent's monster into a vanilla, or as fusion material for some of your Azamanas. Or, with super polymerization, it can do both. As for a silly tech pick, the new Lord of the Missing Barrows seems to be positioned very well here. We're going to be playing spells and traps not only because of our Azamana's back row, but for all the sinful spoils we have access to as well. And not only is this a big fiend, it also gives you some cracked removal when summoned from the hand. Alright, that's everything I have to say about the cards, now it's time for the fun part. The lore. But not necessarily the lore from this set, yet. Sure, the cards we get offer a neat addition to the story, but the real sauce comes from the recently released Valuable Book EX4, which details the story up through its third installment, The Introduction of Diabels. So I want to do a quick skim of all the info so we're on the same page. Prologue 1 of the Sinful Spoils story talks about how demons deceive humans to turn them into living puppets. But a puppet doesn't need a soul, so the demons actually extract the souls of the sinful, which turn into cursed relics. And that's how we get the sinful spoils. The demons feel a bit out of left field at the moment, but trust me, they'll be coming up pretty soon. Prologue 2 is more of a scene setter than anything else. It's a conversation between some tavern patrons about a sour encounter with the demon that seeks the sinful spoils, and that she's going after some ruins in the southeast, looking for a weird eye. And since this little snippet is accompanied by the wanted poster, it's pretty clear they're talking about Dia Bellstar. A little info block also talks about how the sinful spoils should be impossible for normal humans to use, but Dia Bellstar has a special spell that bypasses this restriction. Story 1 unfolds pretty much like it's shown on the cards. The temple that Dia Bellstar is looking for is the Divine Temple of the Snake Eyes, which has been corrupted by the presence of the Snake Eye Sinful Spoil, and Dia Bellstar is forced to fight the Spoil's many minions. It is noted that Flamber's Dragon was once the guardian creature of these lands, but has now become a twisted version of its former self. The battle was hard fought, but Dia Bellstar eventually wins out, using the power of the Sinful Spoil she has already collected, Ursiella and Silvera. However, the battle damaged the Snake Eye Sinful Spoil, causing it to crack and eventually shatter, leaving behind Poplar, a turn of events that Dia Bellstar was not expecting. Story 2 finds us back in the underground city that appears to be the population hub for this story. Dia Bellstar is eager to hit the hay and then do some research on Poplar to figure out what the heck is going on here, and that's where the Goblin Bikers come into play. Turns out, this isn't the first time they've tried to mess with the Black Witch, as they had constantly tried to bring her in for the huge bounty on her head, though after a number of defeats, began settling for just stealing things from her. And this time was no exception. Poplar was fast asleep, so after a quick distraction, the goblins ran off with the fresh sinful spoil, with Dia Bellstar giving chase the second she finds out. But to even the odds, the leader of the goblin bikers, Gabonga, unleashes the goblin's crazy beast, a magical beast that the bikers hadn't been able to tame so they could use it as a mount, similar to the rest of their tricked out beasts. The monster's rampage is what finally gets Poplar out of its nap. And this is where the book drops a little bit of a bombshell on us, stating that Crazy Beast had apparently swallowed a sinful spoil of its own, Aethon which had once belonged to Gabonga, which it had retrieved after a big journey. Poplar, sensing this power, latches onto it immediately. It unhinges its jaw and sucks up all of that magical power, transforming into a gigantic creature. 
Diabelle Star then did the only logical thing, chaining up this new poplar and using it as a flail to beat up the remaining goblin bikers. The bikers then make their retreat in the face of this overwhelming power, but in the blink of an eye, Diabelle's shows up, the Elzette that Diabelle Star knew from her younger years. And by using the power of Morion, sends Diabelle Star and Poplar into a deep slumber. This is where the book ends leading into the White Forest events that we talked about last episode. In fact, Rage of the Abyss gives us a couple more cards to add context to what happens in those flashbacks. The Fiend of the White Forest shows Diabelle partaking of one of those apples from within the woods. Presumably this means that in the Art of Susurus of the Sinful Spoils, the two rookies don't actually eat the fruit, but instead show it to Diabelle who then consumes the fruit, causing the eruption of the Dark Presence within the forest. We also get to see the Mentors being overtaken by this Dark Presence in Sinful Spoils Deception. Presumably what's happening here is that the demons mentioned in the book are now removing their souls to puppet their bodies, which we will eventually see later as their Azamina forms. Those souls will then be retrieved by Dia Bellstar, who will use them on her journey moving forward. And that leads us to the modern day. It seems that both the Goblin Bikers and the Dia Bellstar have been taken to prison. We're not quite sure who made the arrest, but with Dia Bellstar having such a huge bounty on her head, it would be pretty easy for the local authorities to bring her in after she was rendered unconscious. Though, I like to think that it was the Goblin Bikers that actually turned her in, seeing an opportunity now that she was unconscious, but then they get thrown into jail because they're just as big of a band of hoodlums as Dia Bellstar is. One member of the Goblin Biker crew comes to make a great escape as seen in Grand Imprisonment, but they aren't the only one, as Azamina Sol Erisichathon bursts in as well, seen in Goblin Biker Grand Crisis. But the Azamina aren't here for a bunch of ankle biters, they want Dia Bellstar and her sinful spoils. We can see in Ophelettis that Mew, Urcielago, and Rhea Silvera are staring her down. But before we can go into the epic showdown between them, let's take a look at some of those names. Namely, what in the heck is an Azamina? We'll check this out. Azami is the Japanese word for thistles, and thistles are the plants that God cursed the earth with when Adam and Eve ate the fruit of knowledge. You know, the original sin, the original sinful spoils, like the apple-esque fruits within the white forest, the Abrahamic God is furious right now. And now we pivot from Bible references to Greek, specifically Ophelettis, which is Greek for debtor but is meant to refer to sins. And that's my segue into talking about these fusions. With the wolf and bat motifs, it's pretty clear that these two are the soulless husks of Sylvie and Rusia. And we know they're soulless because of the info we got from the valuable book. The dark presence within the white forest is probably one of these demons that goes around puppeteering bodies. With the fruits being used to taint these souls with sin, giving these demons a way to latch onto their souls to rip them out of their bodies. Now, the real mentors, those are with Diabelle Star in the form of the sinful spoils. But that begs the question, what's going on with the other two fusions? Well, Soul Erisichathon is tough to place. It doesn't resemble anything that we've seen before, so we have to look at the rest of the card, and it reveals some fantastic information. See, Soul is a level 6 monster with 2700 attack and 0 defense, requiring a fiend monster as fusion material. And Goblin's Crazy Beast is a rank 6 fiend monster with 2700 attack and 0 defense. And sure, Soul looks nothing like Crazy Beast, but I want to turn our attention back to a little nugget we discovered from the valuable book. Crazy Beast had consumed a sinful spoil, Aethon. Now check this out. Erisichathon is the name of the king of Thessaly in Greek mythology. He cut down a very important tree, and as Greek tales tend to be, things take a very bad turn. Demeter was pretty fond of that tree, so cursed Erisichathon to constantly starve forever. And Aethon is a word that means blazing or burning, and is specifically applied to Erisichathon to describe his burning hunger. So now we're facing off against the puppet form of the soul that Crazy Beast ate, alongside the puppet form of the two mentors, a transformation that we see in Sinful Spoils Deception. 
This also explains why Crazy Beast and Erisichthon look nothing alike. It's because we actually haven't seen Erisichthon's original form. Crazy Beast only ate the soul of that person, so maybe sometime in the future we'll get a better look at who Erisichthon used to be. Oh, and look, while we were explaining all that, it looks like Dia Bellstar has conquered the attacking Azamina as seen in Sinful Spoils Offenders, with each Sinful Spoil standing triumphantly over their puppet bodies. Soul doesn't seem to be present here, uh, they may be going after the Goblin Bikers, though the only other Goblin Biker card here is Badass, which shows them all assembled and even on Crazy Beast's head, but there's no soul in the picture, so we're not sure exactly what happens to it after the break-in though I'm putting my money on it escorting someone else. But before we get too much into that, let's shift gears to our last Azamina, Moa Regina. And they have some pretty interesting features, not the least of which is that it gives me big Albazoa vibes, but I don't currently have anything more than it is also big, white, and spooky, so this theory is going in the back pocket. Though, I think it's notable to say that the weird crown on the back of its head with those gold spikes does kind of look like Dogmatica Maximus's headpiece, just saying. What's more prominent here is Moa's wings. The black feathers are much like the ones that you can see on Diabelle's right sleeve, and they also have these long purple spines along them, much like her nails on that same hand, which is very curious. But the big detail that caught my eye is the snake tail we can see at the top right, which in context of all of these forbidden fruit, feels like this is an indicator that this is the great darkness within the white forest that tempted the students into unleashing the ancient evil, much like how the snake tempted Adam and Eve. But it's not the only place that we see Moa. Hamarsha shows Diabelle's as returned to the white forest, now looking much darker than it was before, who appears to have an audience with Moa, holding Poplar under her arm. Now, the word Hamarsha is used to describe a fatal flaw in a protagonist, so in the context of this card, I think we're supposed to take away that this is that Diabelle's is using Poplar to get close to Moa to get her revenge, thinking that she's powerful enough to subdue this great demon all on her own. Alternatively, Diabelle's is using Poplar as some kind of bartering chip, hoping to get back her mentors, thinking that the great demon will follow through with a deal like that. But no matter what her intentions, I'm sure things are destined to go very, very wrong here. And that's where our story leaves off, at least for now. Diabelle Star, recently victorious over the demons that had controlled her mentors' body, will now find a way back to the forest that traumatized her and her companions, hoping to save Poplar and prevent a calamity from happening after the demons get a hold of the original sinful spoil. But we're going to have to wait a few more months before we get the next chapter of this story. So now, I pass these questions on to you. For instance, why is Diabelle's an illusion like the Azamina's? Is it to show her allegiance? Is she herself already being puppeted by the demons? A part of me wants to say that the Azamina are Diabelle's minions herself because they all use an illusion as material, so it's part of her power animating them. But Hamarsha very much is giving off that Diabelle's is, in fact, working for the Azamina in some way. It's hard to get a handle on Diabelle's motivations, but I do believe that's intentional. But I think it's safe to say that Dia Bellstar will be making a beeline to her old home to get Poplar back, and who knows, maybe the Goblin Bikers will help provide some transportation. Like, you know how we got a Snake Eyes Dia Bellstar card? I think we're going to be seeing a Goblin Biker Dia Bellstar in the near future, mark my words. But with all that out of the way, where do you think this story is going to go from here? Are there any story beats that I missed out on? And which cards out of this cycle is your favorite? Let me know down below, and if you haven't already, please be sure to like the video if you liked it, subscribe so you don't miss an episode, and be sure to share this video with somebody you know who loves Yu-Gi-Oh, especially lore. It really does a lot to help me out. Today's episode is brought to you by Dragon Shield. Get the sleeves as strong as dragon scales, and get 5% off your order by using the coupon code GOLDENNOVA at checkout. It was also brought to you by my lovely patrons, including this month's illustrious Quasar Commanders, Upstairs Media, and The Wizard Moose, Nebula Navigator's Third Dynasty, 50 Gigabits, Ada Basilisk, Adams Agedel, Oexo Toahime, Anansi Dragon, Ancient Wizard, Andrew Newman, Kane Senpai, Chibi Gohan, Christopher Fuss, Clockswork, Comrade Copperbottom, Eric, Frankie, Garland Chaos, Green Knight, Gloomba331, Great Big Pillock, 
Hair Bear, Harry the Ominous Benefactor, Howling Zangetsu, Iron Zero, Iskander 711, Carp, Leo 458, Mana Charge, Marion James E. Piccata, Mega Combi, Millennia Asta, Mern, Muse Clark, Nathan Vig, Natiel Lee Alexander, Orozco 09096, Panther J, Pat Poos, Rebel King Lucifer, Red Eyes Jackalow, RJ the Jank Monarch, Serenity Towns, The Critic of Innocence and Thievery Coast, Cosmic Crusaders Andrew J. Whitaker, Ariel Kersey, Baden Von Titty Sprinkles, Bilzifer, Beluga Masta, Blitzwolf, Chaz Ghost, Dr. Reaper R.I.P., Eki Bullock, Eva Padilla, Hike Boyajian, Herbal D, Ignis Heat the True Draco Slayer, Inblink, Kale the Dragon, Kivon Public, Lobomaru 02, Manga Pages, Matt Simmons, McSpoofy, Michael Shimabukuro, Nitromo, Nyx, Obsidian, Shizuka Nijimura, Sophie, apparently, Stephen Williamson, Taylor Seymour, The Legendary Raven, The Phantom Knights of Shitted Pants, The Pokemon 52, Tiger X2476, Weasel King of Weaseltown, and Zaldreka, as well as the wonderful Starlight Explorers you see on screen now. If you'd like to help me in my journey to cover all of Yu-Gi-Oh's archetypes, get my videos early, be a part of these credits and other awesome perks, it would mean the world to me if you'd check out the link to my Patreon in the description or consider joining as a YouTube member. And if you'd like to catch up on the story of Star, check out this playlist where I have all the videos covering this story right here. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.